Book 3. Chapter 1. Once arrived in Monterio, the two knights without any noise or pomp, but as quietly as possible dismounted before the Temple of Mars and, having entered it, had fires lighted upon the altars, into which they poured pleasant incenses. They had their armors taken off and offered them the holy altars in reverence and perpetual honor of the valorous God. And then, dressed in very white vestments, they went all by themselves to the Temple of Venus which was nearby. After Florio had it opened, he killed with his hand a young calf whose entrails he put with devout hand in the lighted fires to honor Venus. While Florio was doing these things, a quiet murmur was heard throughout the temple, after which upon the holy altars was seen the holy goddess, crowned with laurels and so happy in her countenance as she had never been seen before in any event, and with subdued voice she began to speak thus. O oh you, young and eager defender of our rights, it has pleased the gods that I should offer to you the crown of your triumph in order that in the future you have greater hope in our services and virtuous deeds, and stronger faith in our words. And this said, with her own hands she took the crown from her head and crowned Florio with it. Then Florio, very happy within himself for so much grace, began to say this. O oh, holy goddess, by whose pity are soothed all those who feel in their hearts the arrows of your son, as I do, for as much as my ability allows me, I thank you for this honor which you have bestowed upon me with your divine hand. But since your power, more than my valor, was wrought in today's battle, with this crown I will adorn your altars in your honor. And having said this, he took the crown from his head, put it upon the holy altars with very great reverence, and arose. After he came out of the holy temple, no other temple was left in Montorio which was not visited by him and honored with worthy sacrifices. After this was done, he and Escalian returned to the palace of the duke as fresh as if they had never borne any arms, they went up to the hall, where they found the duke with many others who were wondering and discussing what could have happened to Florio whom they had not seen that day. When the duke saw him, he went to meet him and received him happily, saying. Sweet friend where have you been today that we have not seen you? Indeed, we were all preoccupied about you. To him Florio replied making great merriment. In truth I have been, an Ascalian with me, in a beautiful garden with ladies and pleasant maidens, spending, in amorous mirth this entire day. This pleases me, said the duke. And this is the life which valiant young men in love should lead, instead of giving themselves to idle thoughts, wasting themselves, and consuming time without any usefulness. Chapter 2 King Felix, who with different heart than his face showed had received Biancofior from Florio, took her to the queen and said. Lady, take, here is your Biancofior, whose death the gods did not want. Protect and cherish her since the fates help her, perhaps they are saving her for greater things than we can see. The queen took her in with joyous face and heart, very happy that she had been delivered from that death, and after having feasted and honored her greatly and dressed her with royal vestments, together with her she visited all the temples of Marmarina, giving due thanks and making devout sacrifices to each god or goddess who had rescued her from such danger. Thus, before they returned to the royal palace, no god was left without sacrifices except Diana, whom they had forgotten inadvertently. But having returned to the palace, Biancofior was restored to that benevolence and grace of the king and the queen, and of all that ever had been, every day waxing better, and, not showing to them that she cared or had animosity toward anyone for what she had unjustly suffered, but still without making any mention or reminiscing, she got along with everybody smoothly and well. Chapter 3 Once returned to Montorio, Florio, no less happy for having rescued Biancofior than for the victory achieved, having also somewhat quenched his eyes of the long thirst, took a rest after the hardship endured and began to lead a happy life, rejoicing for the help of the gods which, he saw, was given to him. And already it seemed to him that the fates were being benevolent toward him and, therefore, he hoped that soon his wishes would be fulfilled. Hence his joy was without compare in Montorio, and the horses, that because of his amorous sorrow had for a long time rested in neglect, now ridden by him with the reins held expertly, running to different business, recover the time lost. And he, dressed with Syrian clothes woven by Turkish hands, resplendent with Indian gold, shows off his handsomeness crowned with leaves. Other times with the dogs and a strong bow he hunts the timid deers in dark forests, and in the open plains the flying birds show to him delightful hunts, and oftentimes the cool fountains of Montorio are sought by him with various pleasures. No joy was lacking to him except his Biancofior, who was much farther away than hope suggested to him. Chapter 4 
while Florio was leading a happy life in the future hope that was deceiving him, the not pacified fortune, envious of the fallacious good, could not bear to keep hidden from him her clouded face, but hastening to shorten the happy time, one day she suddenly assailed him with these thoughts. In the hour when the sun seeks rest, the enamoured youth had entered a pleasant garden, full of herbs, flowers, and fruits. As he went slowly through it being far away from his friends, he saw among many briars a very beautiful and white flower, which preserved its beauty even among the thick thorns. Florio lingered to look at it, and it seemed to him that the flower could in no way grow up, without being pricked and ruined by the surrounding thorns, and neither could expand or grow bigger. Whereupon he quietly began to think and to reason thus within himself, alas, who or what could illustrate more clearly the life and situation of my Biancofiel than this white flower? I see every point of the surrounding thorns aimed at the fresh flower, and almost every one of them is ready to ruin its beauty. These points are the guiles set by my father and my mother for the innocent life of my Biancofior, which they do not let her move much without bitter punctures. Oh, how wretched is my life! Now why have I, in recent times, rejoiced so much hoping that the endless adversities incurred by Biancofior because of me had departed from my mind? Alas, why did I leave you to my father after the awaited deliverance? With these and other words he returned very melancholy to his room, in which he locked himself all alone. And here, having thrown himself upon his bed, he began to weep with these words. Oh, most beautiful maiden, have my parents yet ceased to set evil traps for your life? The unfair seneschal, your most cruel enemy, is dead, certainly, they should have ceased. But I do not believe that because of his death the malice of the king has diminished. My guilty fortune, I believe, often causes pain for you, therefore, I think that traps are more than ever being set for your life. Oh, wretched me, where have I left you? I left the frightened little sheep among the ravenous wolves. Oh, where did I leave my Biancofior? Among those who are hungry for her life and wish to drink her innocent blood with unquenchable thirst. Surely the commandment of the holy goddess was the cause of it, I wish the most high Jupiter had not let me observe it. Woe is me, Biancofior, in what bad time were we born? On account of me they seek to hurt you with continuous eagerness because I love you, and I am forced to stay away from you so that I might forget you, but of course, this is impossible, for love tied us with bonds that cannot be untied. Nothing but death can separate us, because we do not consent to it and love does not want it. On the contrary, it grows constantly with more strength in my unfortunate heart so as to make me fear about everything, and it has grown to such magnitude that I almost fear you do not love me or you may abandon me for someone else. Or perhaps even to soothe my mother or to save your life, which I saved with my own arms, you may stop loving me, whoa, what bitter pain that would be. Oh, gracious maiden, do not forget the one that never forgets you, may the gods grant that as I carry you in my heart you carry me. With such reasonings and thoughts and weepings the loving youth spent that day and the greater part of the night, and no sleep could enter his bosom because of the continuous clash of thoughts and abundant sighs which hindered his sleep. But after a long time, the heavy head took in the frightened sleep and he rested until morning, maybe with no smaller battles in his sleep than while being awake. Alas, how bitter is the life of a lover who, always in doubt, lives in jealousy. As long as Procris did not doubt Cephalus her life was without anguish, but after she heard a bad reporting servant mention Aurora, whom she did not know, she was full of painful preoccupations until she came to an unexpected death. Chapter 5 When the clear day arrived, Florio got up. Because of the light sleep he had not forgotten his painful thoughts and, once up, did not leave the sad room as he was accustomed to do the other mornings. Instead, staying in there he turned back upon the thoughts of the previous day. While he was lingering on them, the duke, who had awaited him for a long time, entered the room saying. Florio, arise, do you not see that the sky smiles? Let us go to partake of the usual delights. And he had barely stopped speaking when, looking at him in the face, he saw him to be pale, melancholy, and full of worries, and his eyes, turned red from crying, were circled by a purple hue. He marveled at this and, having changed the tone of his voice, he said. O oh Florio, what sudden change is this? What thoughts occupy you? What happening has affected you so much that your semblance appears melancholy? Florio shamefully lowered his face and did not reply to him. But as his self-pity grew because he had been seen by a person who felt pity for him, he began to cry and to drench the ground with bitter tears. As the duke saw that, completely stupefied, he began to talk again. 
Oh Florio, why all these tears? Where has the MYRTH of the past days gone? What new things brings you to this? Surely if the fates had granted me so gracious a crowning as it was the one that you received for your notable victory, told to me by others rather than by you I do not believe that any happening could upset me. Therefore, leave the crying, which is an act of women and of pusillanimous heart, raise your face toward the sky, and tell me what reason makes you grieve. You know that I am a very close relative of yours, and if that were not so, you are well aware that I am close to you by perfect friendship, and who will help men in need and in adversities with advice and help, if not relatives and dear friends? And whom shall one trust if one does not trust a friend? Tell me safely what is the reason for your sadness, in order that I can first offer you the proper comfort and then help in deeds. Remember that as long as the wound is kept concealed from the doctor, it becomes putrid and it ruins the body, but revealed, it is many times cured easily. Therefore, do not keep from me that thing which causes your sorrow, because I wish to give you, according to my ability, full comfort and to free you from it. Chapter 6 After some time, Florio raised his tearful face and thus replied to the awaiting duke. The sweet asking that you do and duty force me to answer and to reveal that which I thought you knew. And since I hope that my revelation to you will not be without comfort, I will begin from the start to tell you the cause of past and present sorrows, although the tears, which I cannot hold back, may hinder me somewhat. In the tender years of my childhood, as you probably know, I was constantly with the pleasant Biancofior, born in the paternal house on the same day as I, whose beauty, noble manners and ornate speech generated a pleasure which clutched my young heart so hard that I saw nothing else which I liked so much. And multiplier and retainer of this pleasure in my mind was a very clear beam which, as an arrow shot from the bow runs with sharp point to the opposite target, thus moving from her beautiful eyes, terminates into my heart, after entering through my eyes, and this was the principal owner in place of her. And since this beam augmented the flame of such desire, every day it grew Joe much that it became apparent outwardly and then she revealed to me that she was enamored of me no less than I was of her. This was not kept concealed for long by our signs, which revealed it to our teacher, who several times tried to push back with serious reproaches that which would be impossible for the gods to turn back. But once brought to the attention of my father, he figured that by sending me away from her, he would cast her out of my memory, if all of Lethe would pass through my mouth, it could not put her out. Nevertheless, his separating me from her was not without great pain for my soul and that of Biancofior. And to this place he relegated me in exile, under the cover of wanting me to study. But while I stayed here, being away from that beauty in which all my wishes do and will converge, I began to grieve and my grieving heart did not let me exhibit a cheerful face, and of this you became aware many times. Now, how my sorrow became manifest to the king, I do not know, but he either for this reason or for some other wickedness attributed unjustly to Biancofior tried to kill her and, in her death, my soul. You were present at the secret hidden betrayal, it was no secret to you that she was condemned to ignominious death, yet you confided nothing of it to me. But the merciful gods and this ring did not allow this to happen, the latter signaling her predicament to me with its clouded hue and the gods by revealing it to me in my sleep, they alerted me about her safety and, by giving me their forces, with victory I rescued her life as well as mine. Then I received the proper crowning for such a battle, after I had returned the naive dove between the adept talons of the merciless falcons for which I now grieve, remembering it and believing to have done wrong. And more pains are brought to me by the real imaginings that go through my mind, for I seem to see once more the poisoning of the precious bird, the unjust condemnation of my Biancofior, and the fire being lit is greater than ever. And I feel as if I have around my heart a very bitter river of her tears, all of which cry for help. I do not know what to do, I am in love, and love fills my heart with various anxieties which constantly rob me of any rest, any delight, and any mirth, and they will until I receive Biancofior in my arms as mine, in such a manner as to never more fear for her life. I can no longer express my grief to you with full coherence, but I believe that it is more manifest to you from my face than from my words. May the God soon grant me the consolation I seek, because if it is delayed too long in coming, I sense my life consuming itself in the love flame like that of Meliga was consumed in the fated log. Having said this, he lost all his power and fell back supine on the expensive bed, his face having turned pallid as dry soil or discolored ash. Chapter 7 the duke, who with sad heart was listening to what was not unknown to him, upon seeing Florio fall back supine upon the bed, could not hold back the tears through strength of heart, 
but weeping pitifully, he took into his arms the enamoured youth to whom apparently no feeling was left, and having recalled with precious liquids the lost spirits back to their places, he began to speak to him thus. Valiant young man, I feel much compassion for your miserable life so much that I can feel no more, and I strongly believe that it is true that you are compelled by love as you tell me, although love is such a noble experience that it would not allow anyone who holds him as a master to lead as wretched a life as you lead. I have already experienced this fact myself, as it should apply especially to you who have true cause to rejoice, as you have if I have heard your words well. According to your words you love Biancofio more than anything else, likewise, you say that she loves you more than anything else. Therefore, if you consider well what I intend to tell you, no man should make greater merriment than you or be, according to my opinion, happier because the thing that one wishes most while in love is to be loved because if all other things which belong to love shall be had without this, they could not provide any complete good or pleasure because the spirits would not be united. Therefore, this one more than the other goods of love should be held dearly. To acquire this usually means much hardship and annoyance for the lovers. If they acquire it by striving, all their labor or the greater part of it will seem to have an end, and of this fact is the ancient age full of examples. You have already heard what Melanian endured from Hylias to gain the love of Atalanta, how many times he carried upon his shoulders the heavy nets and other things necessary for the hunt in the service of the cruel woman to acquire that love. And how much happiness came to the heart of Acontius when he realized that by trickery, he had attained the love of Sadeep. You possess this love straightforwardly. For this you do not have to endure any hardship. You should not have any perturbation or melancholy in your heart. And having this as you do, jealousy and every unpleasant anxiety should be far from you, and wherein you sadden yourself you should rejoice for the acquired good. Furthermore, from your talk I understand that you have the gods and the power of the ring to help you. Now what do you believe that could be against you if you have such help with you as that of the gods, whose power nothing can resist? Leave the crying to the wretched ones for whose predicaments only their ingenuity has been left as a helper. You must realize that since the gods take care of your needs, if they do not grant that you be presently with Biancofior, it is not without a good reason. Man does not know the truth about future things, but nothing is hidden to the gods. You must believe that they think about your welfare, and I believe without doubt that this sojourn is not without great benefit for you. We must patiently suffer their pleasure. If they wanted, you would be with her now, the desire to go against their pleasure made the great army of Pompey lose in the field of Thessaly, being attacked by the small army of Caesar. Also, you show that it grieves you very much the fact that your father wanted to let Biancofior die, and you fear that the reason of that death was that the king came to know of the sad life which you led because of her, and you are afraid that a similar case might reoccur. If that happened again it would be not surprising but right, since you know that your father will wreak his anger against Biancofior because you live in sadness for her, and you, instead of rejoicing because she is alive, as one who is desirous of Biancofior's life, you waste your life in tears and sorrow to shorten hers. Certainly, this is not an act of love toward her, it is more like mortal hatred. And even if no news came to your father of your being sad, yet you must want the welfare and comfort and happiness of her, if you love her so and she loves you as you say, these things you try to take away from her by leading the kind of life that you do, indeed, you must believe that if this will be reported to her about you, she will pine away in grief hearing that you grieve. Therefore, no cause and no reason wish that you lead this life. You love and are loved, and the number of people to whom this happens is very small, you have the help of the gods, who are always anxious about your welfare, and you have seen this in actuality. Therefore, take comfort, and if you do not want to cheer up for yourself, do it for the love of her and of us, so that she and we may have reason to rejoice. Of course, you are distant from her, something which I believe is annoying you considerably, but such a sweet fruit as that of love cannot be tasted without some bitterness, the things which are carved for a long time are then more appreciated. To Penelope it seemed sweet to approach death, hoping that every tomorrow Ulysses would return first from Troy and then who knows from what place. Think that you will not be forever here or without her. If I were in your place, I would through saner counsel, employ simulation. I would show by making merry that I did not care any more or remember about Biancofior, and I would hold the amorous flame deep within with powerful restraint. Maybe if you act in this manner your father might believe that you have forgotten her and allow you to return more quickly to see her. 
You have heard what I have told you, and I told it to you as someone who being in a similar case would wish to hear it from others, nevertheless, if you know of a wiser advice, reveal it to me unashamedly, for I do not intend to contradict you nor to ever deviate from your pleasure. I beg you as much as I can, as a close relative and true friend, to cast from you every fear and worry, since we can easily ascertain your doubts. And as I have told you before, you must not have any preoccupations, therefore, arise and let your valour win over the unfounced thoughts which beset you because of the solitary idleness. Partake of some pleasures, as we have done in the past, so that in idleness your thoughts will not assail you and your life may not be consumed so miserably. In this way I hope that the gods with their goodwill will graciously provide to put a deserved completion to your wishes, may be now unthought of by you or never by others. Chapter 8 Florio liked very much the trusted advice of the duke, thus, having raised his head, he replied sighing, Dearest relative, it cannot be that this noble passion of love does not sometime make the wisest men, let along me, lead a similar life when they are subject to it as I am. Therefore, do not wonder about me, but believe that I am so in love as ever any young man was or can be. What you have told me I know definitely to be true, therefore, inclined to follow your advice as much as I can, I straighten myself up. Let us go and do what you believe can be good for your consolation and mine. And having said this, they both arose, left the room and, after climbing upon portly horses, they went with a large company to an arranged hunt, where that day they had great happiness and feast. Chapter 9 I am saying that by rejoicing in such manner for many days, Florio covered again his sorrow although he often contrived to be alone as much as he could in order to think about his Biancofiore without disturbance. And when it happened that he could be alone somewhere he would immediately begin to imagine to be with his body there where he continually dwelled with his soul. Sometime he would imagine to have Biancofio in his arms and give her loving kisses and receive as many from her and speak loving words to her and be with her as he had been other times in his childhood years. And while he was in such thoughts, he felt infinite joy, but as soon as he would draw out of it and come back to reality and find himself away from her, then his false joy would change into real sorrow, and he would cry for a long time regretting his predicaments. Then going back to that reverie sometimes he remembered the sad tears that he had seen her weep in the dark dress as she feared the burning fire, when he, unrecognized, placed himself in danger to rescue her, then he regretted it to have returned her to his father and without making himself known at least to her in order that he could have consoled her somewhat and reassured her of the love he bore for her. And many times, he called himself wretched and weak-hearted, saying, how faulted can be my life, if one thinks that I love this maiden above all the things of the world and for this love I live in so much distress away from her, yet I am not so daring as to have the courage to go and see her and I abstain for fear of one man who would rather hurt himself than me. Why did I not go and enter my houses and abduct her and bring her with me here? Once I have her, every pain, every jealousy, and every suspicion will be gone from me. Who will dare criticize my enterprise or oppose it? No one. On the contrary, I will be regarded as more courageous because of it, whereas now I must be reputed as being very cowardly. Am I more cowardly than Paris who went after the woman of his desires not in the house of his father but of his enemies, and did not fear to wait by and by for Menelaus, eager seeker of her? I must not be afraid that she might be demanded back by someone, neither with arms nor in any other manner. The worst that might ensue from this for me will be that my father will grieve for it, and if it hurts him, let it hurt. I like it better for him to grieve than for me to die of grief. And yet when he will see that I have done that of which he is wary, the grief will pass, if it wants to pass, if not, it will kill him, I wish it had already killed him and then there would be no more of it. I want to do it, a thing done has a head. And even if he wants to harm the life of Biancofio because of this he will harm mine as well, nothing can be done against her that I will not feel as she does. If he wants to take her away from me by force, I will defend her with force. I will not be weaker than he in friends and power, and even if he were stronger than I, can he do no more than to cast me out of his kingdom. If he does, I will be in another. The world is big enough, going about wandering will give me grounds for experience. For Cadmus the going about seeking Europa and not finding her was cause for eternal fame, likewise, the necessity to leave their kingdom was for Dardanus and Siculus the cause of very great things. I want to do it also. The consequences for me cannot be any worse than they are now. And then he would go back to crying, and in these thoughts he spent a greater portion of his life. 
and he was so inclined that he wanted to put his plan into effect, and he would have too, were it not for the restraint of the duke and Ascalian, who cheered him up with better hopes and chided his intentions. Chapter 10 The mind of Florio was so tormented by these and many other thoughts that he could in no manner hide his grief or enjoy any pleasure, and melancholy had already so overwhelmed him that even if he had wanted, he could have hardly shown a happy semblance. Because of this he had weakened his vitality so much that the food he could take in was little or almost nothing and sleep could not enter his bosom, for which reasons his face had turned pale and emaciated, his limbs had been thinned because of leanness, and he had become weak and tired. He lay down for most of the day and he was like those who burdened by a long illness are seeking new things and like none, and if they like something they cannot eat it. The duke as well as Ascalian were very sad about this and did not know what to do about it. They hesitated to let the king know of it, fearing that because of this he would do something new to Biancofior and that Florio would have the worst of it. Likewise, they hesitated to let things go on in this manner without letting him know saying, if he hears about this from someone else, we will be blamed for it, and he will be angry toward us and will have reasons to be. And in this manner, they tarried several days without making a decision, still comforting Florio and giving him good hope. To them Florio would answer that he was not like this because of love but that the heat was wasting him away. But this excuse was not believed by those who knew the reasons for his signs, but they, as if forced to do so, supported it. Chapter 11 One day while the Duke and Ascalian were discussing together the matter of Florio very vigorously, being anxious of his welfare, Ascalian began to speak thus. Undoubtedly nothing is loved by Florio as much as by Ancofior, and from this the king, by keeping him away from her, and we, with words, have tried many times to pull him out, but we could not, I firmly believe that this is the will of the gods and to wish to oppose it is madness. Nevertheless, perhaps it would not be wrong to try some way and by chance our intent could be accomplished. And what course would you advise to take, said the duke? Ascalian replied, I will tell you. As you know young men are very fond of carnal conjunctions because their importune nature leads them to such, and for them they are wont to forget everything else. Florio never had any carnal pleasure with Biancofior, and if we could contrive so that he would have it with some other beautiful young woman, it would be easier for him to forget that which he does not have for that which he has, and even if he did not forget her completely, at least he would not think about her so much and on this matter the king or the gods should provide some means, in order that we would succeed without shame or damage. And if this way is not useful to us, I do not know of any other useful one. The duke thought about this for a long time and then he said. Ascalian, I am very much surprised at you. Supposing that what you have advised were carried out completely, what would we have accomplished? Nothing, for I do not know what can be accomplished by untying him from one place and tying him unto another. But it could go so far that we may easily worsen our condition, and taking Biancofior out of his heart is not such an easy thing, I believe, that it could be done through this, although it can be easily tried, if it seems good to you. Ascalian said, of course, I thought it was a good idea because if he happens to forget Biancofior through someone else, it would be easier to take that someone else out of his heart than to try to take Biancofior now without any means. In fact, new woods can be cured with less danger, better, and more quickly than old ones. Indeed, said the duke, this is true. And since you think so, it will cost us nothing to try it. Therefore, let us think about it and see if it does any good, and if we see it working, we will proceed forward with the help of the gods. Chapter 12 Having agreed on this, they secretly set out to find some maiden who would look as much as possible like Biancofior, thinking that such a person would be more agreeable to him than anyone else and could bring him more quickly to the desired goal. As they sought this, someone who used to be always in the company of Florio showed them two young maidens endowed with marvelous beauty and attractive speech and born of noble parents. These, according to the words of the one that pointed them out, were very fond of the beauties of Florio, but not, as if, in love with him because they did not deem themselves equal to him and therefore, they restrained their will with their reason. As they came to know those two, they rejoiced greatly saying. Let us take them both, since they both like Florio. They will try hard to make Florio like them, and where one would fail, the other will fulfill. Having decided this, they had them summoned to the house under the pretext of inviting them to a feast. When they came before the duke and Ascalian, the duke spoke to them thus. 
Young maidens, it is our intention to give Florio the company of a beautiful wife, and seeking in this city a woman who would be rightly suited for him we have found none with so much beauty, so many and praiseworthy manners, as you two have been recommended to us. And therefore, we have sent for you to see if you can pull him away from some preoccupation that he has and make him like you, to give him then as wife the one that he will like best of you two. To which one of these two, called Adia, answered thus. Our Lord, we marvel not little at your word since we definitely know that we are not maidens endowed with as much nobility as it behooves the greatness of Florio. On the other hand, we lack the very large riches which easily cover the faults of nobility. Therefore, we dearly beg you not to make fun of us and yet we remind you that, since you must be the guardian of our honor, like a good and legitimate lord, you should not be the cause of such shame, for you must realize that although we are small to you and yours, we are dear and very great to ours. Then the duke answered, Young maidens, do not believe that I will bring myself to such depravity as this one would be if I were, as you say, to make you lose your honor. But I swear on the soul of my father and on our gods that what I have told you I will truly attain for you, if he will like either one of you. Idea said, Since you affirm it with an oath, we will do your pleasure. Tell us how it pleases you that we do and so it will be done, then let the gods grant this grace to whoever of us too is worthy of it. The duke replied, This is the way. You will adorn yourself in that manner which you believe pleases most, and without any company you will go in your garden, in which he comes customarily every day as soon as the rays of the sun begin to be less hot. Come out to meet him, making whichever merriment and leading him in whatever discussion that you believe might please him most. Then whichever of you two he will choose that one, I say, will be his. Chapter 13 that garden was very beautiful, full of trees and fruits and fresh grass, which were bathed by several fountains through various streams. Therein, as the sun had crossed the meridian circle, the two young women, dressed with very thin vestments upon their tender flesh and with their hair fixed by expert hand, with hope to please most and to acquire such a husband, entered all by themselves and sought therein fresh shades, which they found next to a very clear fountain, and there they sat waiting for Florio. Having arrived the time when the heat was diminishing, melancholy Florio left his room and with slow steps, not knowing anything about those things, wearing a rich coat of silk, entered all alone into the garden as he was accustomed to do in the past, and he directed his steps toward that place where once before he had already seen the white flower among the thorns. And having come here he stopped, tarrying for a long time deep in thoughts. The young girls had both made a garland with the leaves of Bacchus, and waiting for Florio they stood by the fountain talking about him. Not having seen him enter the garden, in order to pass more easily the boredom of waiting, they began to sing a love song, with such a sweet and clear voice that it seemed to be that of angels rather than of human creatures, and the whole garden seemed to resound happily from those voices. When Florio heard these voices, he marveled greatly saying, What novelty is this? Who sings herein now and so sweetly? And with his ears listening for the sound, he began to walk in the direction from which he heard it, and when he came to the fountain, he saw the two young girls. They were very white in their faces, and that whiteness was mixed properly with pink complexion. Their eyes looked like morning stars and their small mouths, the color of a million rows, became more pleasant in moving with the notes of their song. Their hair was very blonde, like threads of gold, somewhat curly, and rolled between the green branches of their garlands. Because of the great heat, as it has been said previously, their tender and delicate flesh was dressed with very thin vestments, which, being very tight from the waist up, showed the form of their beautiful breasts, which like two round apples pushed out the tight robe, and still in more places their white flesh could be seen through pretty openings. Their stature was of convenient height and they were well proportioned in every part of their bodies. Florio upon seeing this stopped, completely confused, and they, as soon as they saw him, silenced their sweet song, happily rose toward him, and in bashful manner they greeted him humbly. May the gods grant your wish, answered Florio. To this they replied, the gods have already granted it, if you will grant it to us. Please, said Florio, why have you forsaken your enjoyment because of my arrival? No greater enjoyment could we have than to be with you and to talk to you, they answered. Certainly, and I like it well, said Florio and having sat down with them near the clear wave of the fountain, he began to look them over, now this one and then the other one, to rejoice on his face and to wish to be able to please them. And after a while he asked them, young maidens, tell me what were you waiting for here all by yourselves? 
to be sure, answered Adia, we were here with a larger company, but the others wishing to go and see other things left us here alone, as if tired, and will return for us before the sun hides itself. As for us, we stayed willingly behind, thinking that perhaps we could see you, just as fortune has permitted us to. Their company was very welcome to Florio and he enjoyed very much looking at them, noting in his mind each of their beauties, and sometimes saying to himself, blessed is he to whom the gods will give so much beauty to possess. He steered them into divers discussions of love, and they, did the same to, him. He had the head of one in his lap and the delicate arm of the other upon his white neck, and often with a subtle glance he would direct his eyes between the white robe and the pink flesh to see more openly that which the thin clothes did not cover completely. Sometime he touched their white throat with a timid hand and another time he strived to put the fingers between the cleavage of the dress and the breasts, he tried to probe each part of the body with joyful act, and nothing was denied him, about which he oftentimes wondered to himself for so much familiarity and for such happening. Nevertheless, he was so happy within himself that he did not seem to feel badly about anything, and poor Biancofior was completely gone out of his memory and lingering in this way for no short time, they with him and he with them had gone so far that nothing but shame restrained them from reaching that effect any further than which nothing more can be asked of a woman. But loyal love which heard all these things, feeling himself offended, did not tolerate Biancofior, who had never thought of acting similarly toward Florio, to receive this injury, but with his sharp arrows came quickly to rescue the heart which through oblivion was already bending foolishly toward some other direction. And I say that being Florio so intimately clasped with them, by and by the two women had almost brought their plan to completion without the strain of many words, when the other of the two girls, named Calmina, having raised her blonde head and looked at him in the face, asked him, Say, Florio, tell me what is the reason for your paleness? You seem to have changed completely just recently. Have you heard anything troublesome? Then Florio, wishing to answer her, remembered his Biancofior, who was the cause of the question paleness, and without replying to her he uttered a very deep sigh saying, Woe is me what have I done? And almost repenting what he had done he withdrew from them somewhat, beginning to think hard, with his eyes on the ground, about what he had done and to say to himself, Ah! Villainous man, not born of royal progeny but a very low one, what betrayal is that which you have contemplated until now? How could you have put Biancofior into so much oblivion, for these or for other women, as to desire that which you wished from them, or as to be able to show love toward anyone as you did toward them by touching them? Our most perfidious one, every pain is well deserved by you, and surely you will pay dearly for your wickedness. Now how could you lower yourself to love them, whose beauty is a very small percentage of that of Biancofior? And even if it were much greater, how could you ever find anyone who would love you perfectly as she loves you? Say, if she knew this, would she not have reasonable cause not to want to see you any more? Indeed, yes. With many other words Florio grieved for a long time, and while he was grieving so silently, Calmina, who did not know the reason, approached him, asking why he did not answer her, and saying. Please, my soul, answer me. Tell me why you sighed so bitterly just now, tell me the cause of your new vexation, and do not stay away from her who loves you more than herself. Then Florio with sorrowful voice said, Ladies, I beg you for God's sake that it may not be hard for you to let me be, because other thoughts that yours occupy my sorrowful mind. And having said this he would have left that place if it were not for the fact that he did not want to shame them. Then spoke Adia, and what has preoccupied you so suddenly? Just now you were so cordial with us, talking, asking, answering, and chattering, and now, being melancholy, you do not look at us and do not want to talk to us. Surely you make us wonder endlessly. Florio answered nothing, on the contrary as much as he could, with his face turned the other way, he moved away from them. But the more Florio moved away from them, the closer they came to him amorously. And such being the situation, Calmina, who was already inflamed beyond propriety with love toward Florio, being more forward than Adia, came near Florio and barely restrained herself from kissing him, yet she spoke to him like this, O oh gracious youth, why do you not tell me the reason for your sudden melancholy? Why, by staying away from us, do you show to refuse us who just now were so cordially entertained by you? Is our beauty not pleasing to your eyes? Surely the gods would consider themselves satisfied by us, nor do we believe that low carrot, so much persecuted by Juno, was more beautiful than we when she pleased Jupiter, and neither was Europa who for so long burdened the shoulders of the great god, nor do we believe that some other women are more beautiful than we, and yet we see the sky decorated with many. Therefore, why do you refuse us? 
and with these and many other words, and with various and improper actions and sighs they were trying to bring Florio to the business in which he was occupied a while ago. To them Florio said thus. Tell me ladies, if the gods fulfilled your every pleasure, were you ever in love? To him they quickly answered, yes, with you only, we never sighed for any other person, nor did we feel such order if not for you. Surely, said Florio, you are not already in love with me, and that you have never been or are with anybody is clearly seen because love never suffered as much dishonesty in the first meetings of lovers as you have demonstrated toward me, with whom you never spoke before. On the contrary, love makes the hearts timid and adorned with chaste shame until the long familiarity makes the hearts recognize each other as equal. And that this is true was very much manifested by the lecherous Pasiphae who, being in love with a beast and trying to please with dubious hand and fearing to displease, was giving tender herbs to the young bull. Now how much more would he have feared a man in whom there was a rational cognition since she was afraid of a brute animal? Certainly, much more because she was in love. And whoever wished to search further in ancient things, she would find infinite examples of man and woman to whom the strength failed completely at the first meeting with their lovers. Therefore, do not try to make me believe that you are in love with me, for I know your hearts are more inclined to deceive than to love. Moreover, it is also known to me that you are not in love with anyone else as you tell me, for it is not known to me that by forgetting the first lover you could demonstrate what you did, loyal love would not permit it. Hence, I pray you, pretty ladies, to let me be because you believe to lessen my size with your words whereas you increase them in very great quantity, do with me, in every action other than love, that which you would do with a friend or a servant. When she heard this, Idea, whose numberless tears were not far away, drenching her white face, she put her hands on the thin robe and ripped it all in front, saying with tearful voice. Woe is wretched me, damned by the hour I was born. In whom will I now have hope since you, in whom now I hoped and through whom I thought I could feel peace, refuse me and do not believe that my heart pines away for your love, maybe because I appear too eager to fulfill my desires. Please believe that nothing has prompted me to do this other than excessive love, which from my bosom has cast out the proper shame and has made me turn almost furious in your presence. Oh, forlorn me, my life will be desperate from now on. O oh, wretched beauty, depart from my face, since the one for whom I held you dearly and cared for you diligently refuses you. Please, Florio, since you do not like to concede that which a long-held hope has promised me, may it please you that I count my last day in your arms. I feel that all the natural powers are failing the poor heart because of your words. Alas, kill me with your own hand so that I will not live more miserably. Send the sad soul to the doleful shadows of Styx, where she expects smaller anguish than this which she now endures. Woe, how justly you will be blamed when it will be known that the sorrowful Adia left this life because of your cruelty. Florio, who could not tolerate the tears of this one, comforted her out of pity saying. Oh, beautiful maiden, do not ruin your beauty with the bitterness of your weeping, hope that a more gracious young man will grant to you that which I cannot give you. Find your companions and have with them the usual feast, and do not hinder my sighs with the pity of your crying, for I swear to you by my gods that if I belonged to myself and could donate myself at will, no one else would have me if one of you two would not have me. But I cannot give that which is not mine without leave. Then Calmina began to speak, O man more cruel than any beast, how can you consent to deny us that which we ask of you? Certainly, if you have given your love to another woman, no love is so loyal that it could not be broken by our pleas. And do you think that if because of your cruelty one of us happens to suffer a violent death, the woman to whom you belong, if by chance you do belong to anyone, will love you more for it? Certainly not, rather, she will chide your cruelty. And our pleas are so many that surely the chaste Hippolytus would have already given in. Now how can you deny us at least a kiss with which a while ago you would have favoured us, if we had been as forward as you make us? To be sure, if you would give us any with the same intention that we would receive it, this would be no small refreshment for our efforts. Please, then, grant us some in order that the gods will be more benevolently inclined to concede to you what you wish, if anything is desired by you during this act. Florio replied to her, Young maidens, put an end to these discussions because that part of me which you ask for is held by me more dearly than any other, although no other part has yet been conceded to the one to whom I belong completely, and do not ask me any further since you could not get from me anything but pain. And I beg you to leave me alone, for now I like better to sigh than to speak with you, and go on, for what you tell me is all in vain. When the two maidens heard this, their faces blushing with shame, they departed from his presence without speaking any more. 
and since the sun already sought the west, they returned to the great palace and dressed up saying to one another, oh, how just it would be if we never received the favor of any young man, considering our boldness, we who have tried to take this young man away from his lady without reason, although the gods and he have well done to us the honor that we deserved for it. Being dressed they told the duke what had happened with no little shame, and with very generous gifts from him they departed disconsolate and returned to their homes. Chapter 14 the Duke and Ascalian had seen openly what Adia and Calmina had wrought, and there was a time when they believed that their plan would reach the desired goal, but after they saw it fail, sad for the bitter life of Florio, they left the place where they were and came to the garden where Florio had remained all alone, with sorrow, full of thoughts, and they found him pensive with his blonde head leaning upon the left hand. After they looked at him with pity for some time, they began to say, Florio, may love repose you soon in the desired peace. Florio was so deep in thought about his Biancofuel that for their arrival and their greeting he did not move or change his countenance, but remained like one who had not seen or heard them yet. Then Escalian extended his hand, took him by the arm and, pulling him, said. Oh, enamoured youth, where are you now? Do you sleep or by thinking are you so out of yourself that you do not answer our greeting? Florio was then quite startled and, as if stunned, was looking around without answering anything but after a few sighs, somewhat freed from thoughts, he raised his head and said. Woe is me, who leads you here to see the misery of my life from which you believe to perhaps take away the pain with comforting words while instead you add more to it. If it can be, I dearly entreat you to leave me here alone, so that I may find again that thought which I pursued when by shaking me you drew me out of it. To which Escalian thus answered, Love and wonder lead us here, and we do not intend to leave you yet if first to our pleas you will not say what new reason makes you so pensive. Florio said, There is no new reason for my grief, love alone keeps me in this life. And how, said then the duke. I thought that you were trying to follow my advice which I gave to you the other day when I found you so pensive, and already it seemed to me that liking it you had begun, instead, you have returned to the usual way. This life of yours does not seem to be that of someone in love under any circumstances, hence, you make me doubt strongly that perhaps you are out of your sanity, in fact, other people in love try to mitigate their yearnings with various pleasures, but you appear to try to increase them with pains. If you want to say that you cannot do like some others, you know that you would not be telling the truth because there is no stopping you. Then why do you give yourself to grief? Please, as I begged you another time, I still beg you now to partake some of them, making use of which you will while the time with less sadness, and the gods in the meanwhile will provide to your desires. Chapter 15 When he heard those things, Florio said sighing, Friends I know well that you are very concerned about my health and I openly see that my life saddens you, likewise, the pleasures that I might partake are not unknown to me, and you try to draw me to them with so much effectiveness thinking that I might be out of my sanity because even in pain I linger in thoughts. Now in order that you know how I am disposed to partake of them, and also how you should not marvel at my grief, I want to tell you what is my life. Let me tell you that various imaginings and thoughts occupy me continuously, of which I will tell you some. First, I wish to see Bianco for you above all things, as that who is loved by me more than anything else. And I tell you that as many times as she comes to my memory, this wish burns in me so much more furiously and so draws me away from any other thought that if I would see her then I would believe to be more blessed than any god, and realizing that this is being taken away from me, only because I love her and for no other reason, I feel that, no one else's pain is similar to mine. Following this, I live in constant anxiety for her life, fearing that she, who, I know, loves me much as I do her, endures similar pains to those which I endure, which, because she is of a weaker nature than I am, I fear might cause her either a grave illness or death. And what makes me worry even more about her life is the harshness of my father and my mother whom I feel, and I can almost see them, as very eager deceitful enemies of her life there is no fictitious reason which could lead to her death and which I do not imagine to see my father seek to achieve his evil intent, which came to failure another time, and the wretched one does not realize that the moment she dies I will live no longer. Moreover, jealousy keeps me in a very burdensome discomfort, and the reason is this, young maidens have little steadfastness and because of their beauty are beset by many lovers, and the gods, let alone women, are moved by pitiful prayers to do the wish of those who pray. I am away from her, I cannot see her nor she me, many young men I believe beset her because of her beauty which surpasses any other. Now how do I know if unable to have me she will not take someone else, although she will not find anyone better? 
It is customary to say that women have generally this nature, that is, they always take the worse one. Along with these thoughts I have many others, which would hurt me much if I wanted to explain them in detail, but about them I can tell you that they impede my life so much that I am annoyed with it, and as a smaller pain I would desire death, which I would not consider as pain, if the gods would grant it to me, but as welcome joy. You can see how I cannot possibly bring myself to partake of any pleasure, my only good and only joy is to think of Biancofior, and this is what holds in my body the little life that is left of me. Therefore, I beseech you, if you love my life, do not wish to take away from me the privilege to think. Chapter 16 The Duke then began to speak, it is well known to us that you are bothered by as many kinds of thoughts as you tell us and by many more. But you must not therefore wish to replace thinking with death, but rather to prolong your life with pleasure so that you can think for a longer period of time. Hence if any plea will avail, we beg you to take comfort and with constant pleasures to pull yourself away from those thoughts. And if the reason is unknown to you, as your words show, why you must partake some pleasure, we are not surprised, because in this kind of afflictions many times it is customary to lose true cognition. But we who are outside of such a tempest know which are the ways to get out of it, and therefore, do not take harshly some words, which if heard and effectuated by you, will let you see yourself come into a welcome port without danger. You grieve for the burning desire that urges you to see Biancofiel because you cannot see her. I certainly believe that it hurst you, but do you think because of this grief, which you inflict upon yourself, you will see her any sooner? Certainly not. Therefore, you must take comfort in hope, and give considerable pause to the present desire, knowing as you do that presently you cannot fulfill it with honor. Remember that fortune will not hold her will still forever, just as by turning it she took you away from Biancofior, in a similar manner she will bring you back to her still happy. Likewise, I tell you, the preoccupation that you have about Bianco for your possibly suffering a grievous illness or death because of the love that she bears for you is a useless preoccupation, and you have it for nothing because love never brought death where the two sides were of one will. I wish that she might become ill, only if it were because of love, considering that through that illness I could find out that I was loved so much by her that she would contract such an illness simply for not being able to have me. Alas, how much more is health to be thought of, which shows to be unbroken and melancholy far away, therefore, this you must let go of completely. If you are afraid that your father may wish to hurt her as he did once, that is not surprising, for we admire nothing else as much as the fact that he has tolerated her being alive, knowing the kind of life that you lead because of her. Hence, I tell you that by continuing in the present lifestyle you have reason to fear, but if you wish to take comfort and to follow the way that I have shown you another time, you need to have no fear, for I swear on the soul of my father that the king loves Biancofior as much as a daughter, and nothing could bring him to be angry with her other than your inordinate life. If you want to say that jealousy goads you, this is against what you said before, that is, that Biancofior loves you more than herself, jealousy does not usually dwell other than in suspicious places and first you state that there is no suspicion in you and then that you are jealous. But surely, from the way you speak, it seems to me that nothing is loved by Biancofior as much as you are, therefore, on this matter you should not have any worry about her. Moreover, what woman, having the love of so constituted a young man as you are handsome, noble, rich, and son of a king would be so foolish as to leave that for any other? If you want to say, women always take the worse one, this does not apply to all, but only to those who are little wise, and that is found also among men. And truly Biancofior is very wise, and she showed this in her behavior and in her actions. Now then, considering well these things, who should be more cheerful than you? You are handsome, rich, noble, loved by her who loves you, for whose love you should always think of living in a way that will enable you to present yourself to her healthy and appealing. If I were in a similar situation, I would take very good care of myself to make her like me more, and I would greatly wish a long life for nothing else but to be able to serve her for a long time. And you, more overwhelmed by anger and melancholy than advised by reason, you seek death for comfort and you dwell constantly in worries and sorrow, and go imagining those things which you never saw and never will see with the God's will. Foolish is he who without certainty sheds tears for future calamities, and delights more idling in them, tears, than in convincing himself to fight against the calamities. Please, if you are a man like the others, benefit from the many comforts that we render you, let it be beneficial to reveal the truth as we reveal it to you and do not still persist in your fallacious opinion. Rejoice, for wise people lack as much sanity as they lack comfort. Chapter 17 Florio, who was hearing gracious words, being spoken, to the enamoured heart, 
as he had need of them, with less sorrowful face, answered. Friends, one can hardly fight against sudden calamities. But whatever my father has in mind to do, I will still try to take your advice and chase away from me the sorrow for future things. And after saying this they all arose. And coming out of the garden for the stars had already painted the sky with their lights they returned almost happy to their rooms. Chapter 18 While the fates were treating Florio like this, Biancofior, left by him to his perfidious father, had been restored to the usual grace, living in the royal palaces with no smaller quantity of size than Florio had, although she kept them more wisely in her burning heart. But the whimsical adversities which had turned their course toward Florio, with unusual vigor attacked him again miserably in this manner. In those times at the court of King Felix dwelled a young knight, named Felano, noble and handsome, and endowed with virtuous manners, to whom the burning love of Florio and Biancofiore was unknown because he had come from distant places a few days after the cruel sentence of Biancofiore. As soon as he saw the bright beauty of her face, he was immediately smitten with liking for her and began to love her boundlessly and tried to please her in divers ways, although Biancofiore did not care about this at all but, with wise deportment, she showed that she did not know how many of those things he did. The love that Felano held for Biancofiore was not unknown to the king and queen, who, in order that the heart of Biancofiore may be smitten with a new liking and that Florio be forgotten by her, happy about this fondness, oftentimes they would summon Felano to their presence, in front of whom then they let Biancofiore come and speak with her sometimes cheerful words. But this meant nothing because Biancofiore cared little about him, rather, sighing bashfully she would lower her head as she came before him, without ever raising it to look at him, if it had not been some time to please the king and the queen, whom she knew to be happy about such love, although Felano believed that those sighs, which moved from Biancofiore's heart, were omitted because of him. While Biancofiore pretended to love the young knight to soothe the queen, it happened that in those days a very solemn feast was going to be celebrated in honor of Mars, god of battles, and in said solemnity it was customary to play a game in which was revealed all the strength and the ingenuity of the young knights of the town. Felano proposed to show his valor in that game for the love of Biancofiore, but he would not do it unless he had some valuable from Biancofiore which he could wear to that place as a token. Hence, one day, seeing Biancofiore tarrying with the queen he made the move and with hesitant face he thus began to speak to Biancofiore in the presence of the queen. O oh, gracious maiden, whose beauty I believe Jupiter moulded in his breast, and to whom I by order of that lord whose bow strength even the gods could not resist him a most humble and faithful servant, if my pleas deserve to be heard by your kindness, I utter them with that affection which may present them more graciously to you, and I pray you since the feast of our god Mars, whose example I follow as a young knight, will be celebrated a few days hence, during which, as you know, will be played the game of the powerful young men, and I intend to show my strength for the love of you to give me any of your valuables, wearing which as a token I will be given so much more daring than I have as to attain victory. Hearing these words, Biancofiore felt her white face blush with bashful redness, as soon as the knight was silent, and not knowing what to do she turned to the queen, and looked at her in the face with questioning eyes. To her the queen said. Young lady, raise your head. Why are you ashamed? Do you doubt that what the knight has said may not be true? Surely in our great city there is no woman whose beauty can compare to your face. And just because he asks you a favor, as someone who wishes to serve you out of love, that must not be denied by you, but kindly give him one of your things, one which you think may please him more, for it is customary for lovers to sometime give each other their valuables. Then Biancofior said. Most High Queen, what can I give to the knight that will not taint my honor and due faithfulness? The queen answered, Biancofior, do not worry about this, for the maidens to whom the fates have not yet granted a husband can freely give whatever it pleases them without any shame. And how do you know if they are not holding this one for your husband? Therefore, give him something and in order that it may be more welcome, make it the veil with which you are now covering your head. It is something that, even if you were ashamed of, giving, you could deny to have given claiming that he might have gotten it from another woman, since there are many which look like this one. Biancofior, compelled by the words of the queen, with delicate hand unraveled the veil from her blonde head and sighing she gave it to Felano, who received it in so much grace that he believed he would never receive a greater one. And having rendered proper thanks for the gift, with it he departed happily from them. When the time of the game came, he tied the veil around his head, and no one in the game surpassed his strength, by virtue of which, in the presence of Biancofior, he deserved to be crowned with laurels, placed, upon that, veil. Chapter 19. 
Fortune, not content with Florio's tribulations, brought Felano to Montorio a few days after his earned victory. This one, being received honorably by many in the great hall of the Duke, began to narrate to his young knight friends how great had been the honor earned, illustrating with words and actions what strength and ingenuity he had used to earn for himself total victory, as he did. Afterwards having entered in other various conversations, they came to talk about love, and likewise he claimed to be more enamored than any other and of a more beautiful woman, and how there was no grace of hers which would not be given to him if he had asked for, and after many words he inadvertently mentioned Biancofiore. Florio, who was not too far away, had heard all these things and was complaining within himself about love, which was treating him worse than any other enamored, youth, as soon as he heard Biancofiel being mentioned, and from the preceding words, he knew that she was the woman of whom Felena was boasting so much. Suddenly changed in his aspect, he quietly departed from his friends and, after being absent for a short while, he returned to the hall with his usual aspect and, in friendly manner, went up to Felena. As soon as Felano saw him, he rose to his feet with that reverence which was befitting and went to meet him. Then Florio, to ascertain that which he would have not wished to know, pretending that he wanted to talk to him about other things, took him by the arm and without any other company brought him to his room. Here, after both sat themselves upon the bed, Florio with a false face began to ask him about his adventures and about the customs of the faraway countries where he had been. Then when the time seemed right, he said. If the color of your face does not deceive me, you seem to be in love. To which Felano replied. My lord, I love more than all the other young men. That pleases me very much, answered Florio. Because I like nothing better as to have company in my yearning. But tell me, if you please, are you loved by the lady whom you love? Felano said, nothing kindles so much love in my heart as my hearing to be loved by the one whom I love more than myself. Certainly, you fare well, said Florio. But tell me how do you know that you are loved by the one whom you love so much? I will tell you, replied Felano. That I am loved by the one whom I love is made clear by three things. The first is the timid glancing with passionate sighs, in which I openly recognize complete love, next the jewels received make me sure of it, for these would never be given without love by a noble lady. The third thing that demonstrates this is the joy which I see on her pretty face with every happy event which happens to me. The aforesaid things usually are true witnesses of love. But tell me, if you please, what jewel did you ever receive from your lady, because some, women, are in the habit of giving jewels which would not be worthy of taking into account. Surely, said Felano, mine is not one of them, but it is one to hold very dear, and in order that you know how much dearly I must hold the one which I have here with me, I will tell you how I received it. That pleases me, replied Florio. Then Felano began to speak thus, since we had to play the game which is held during the Feast of Mars, which was celebrated a few days ago, in order to play, I went to her presence and humbly begged her to please give me, her most faithful servant, one of her jewels, which I would take into the game for her love. She, being moved by my prayer, in my presence, kindly took this veil from her blonde head with her delicate hands, and taking out the veil he showed it to Florio. Then continuing in his speech, he said, and then she added that for the love of her I should do well. Therefore, if this is a very manifest sign of true love, you, like me, should know it. But it is more than manifest, answered Florio. And certainly, anything else greater can be hoped for by you. Felano said then, I certainly hope for much more in the future, and I believe that with the help of our gods my hope will not fail. Florio, still not satisfied with all this, said to him, Felano, as the gods may quickly bring you that which you desire, tell me, if it is possible, if this lady of yours is beautiful and who she is. Felano replied, My lord, she never ordered me to keep her name secret, and her beauty does not request to be kept hidden from whomever wishes to know of it, and there is nothing which ought to be hidden from you, moreover, I trust so much in the good love which I know she has for me, that even if some people would know about it and, loving her, would want to take her away from me, they could not. Therefore, since it pleases you to know it, I will tell you the name, when you hear it, you will know how great is her beauty. The lady to whom I believe completely and for whom I sigh amorously is called Biancofior, and she lives in the royal palaces of your father in the company of the queen. You know her better than I, and you know well how great is her beauty, hence, you can see whether I am compelled by love through a gracious lady. Florio then looked at him in his face and, without changing his expression, said, Indeed love holds you through a beautiful lady, now I like what you have said even more than before. 
but one thing I entreat you to do, and that is, to love wisely and be careful not to be taken in so much by love as to be unable to depart from him at your will, in fact I, who live full of sighs, grief and nothing else but for the fact that I would like to depart from him but I cannot. And the reason is that I once loved a lady, and I still love her more than myself, and from what I could see she loved me above all things, and in place of true love she gave me this ring, which I wear on my finger and always will for her love. And a short time after, she left me and gave herself to another man of a much lower condition than I am, for which reason now I would like to depart from love and cannot, and I have almost completely lost her. If the same thing should happen to you certainly it would cause grief to any person that loves you. Felano then said, Florio the advice that you give me is good, and if I thought that I would need it I would take it. But without any doubt I know this maiden to be so steadfast that I do not believe she will ever change her intention, that is, to love me. Then you have an advantage above all the others, said Florio. And if it will be so, you can call yourself happier than any god. The dinner hour took them away from this conversation, which did not delight as much one of the two as it was very difficult and bothersome for the other. They left the room, washed their hands, and seated themselves at the prepared tables. Chapter 20 Florio sat at the table without taking in any food, thinking over the words he had heard from Felano, enduring with strong mind with annoying pain which the overwhelmed heart felt because of them. But after the tables were cleared, and everyone was allowed to go wherever it pleased him, Florio went to his room all alone, locked himself in it, threw himself stretched upon the bed, and upon it he began the most violent weeping that any young man in love had ever seen anyone to do, and in his crying he began to call his Biancofior and to say this. Oh, sweet Biancofior, hope of my poor soul, how great has it been the love that I bore for you and still bear since the time we first fell in love in our young years. Surely no one ever loved a lady as perfectly as I have loved you, you alone have been always the lady of my wretched heart. There was nothing which I would not have done for the love of you, no hardship which would have not seemed like to me. Indeed, during the painful event of the sad death to which you had been condemned, no sorrow was similar to mine until I had freed you with my right hand. Alas, forlorn life of mine, how numerous have been my sighs, since I have not been allowed to see you. How many tears have drenched the aching bosom, in which I constantly carry you in effigy as beautiful as you are. Nor any comfort could ever come to me without your name. No conversation was dear to me without your being mentioned in it, the hope of whom leaves me now so barren, at the thought that you have left me for Felano and I cannot see the reason for it. Certainly, you cannot say that I ever loved any other woman but you, I have been tempted by many, but none can boast that I bent somewhat to do their pleasure. Nor do I know of having failed you in any other way. Therefore, why did you like Felano more than me? Say, am I not the son of King Felix, nephew of ancient Atlas, upholder of heavens? Indeed, I am, and Felano is a simple knight. Does his face shine with more beauty than mine? Not ever. Is his virtue greater than mine? If it could only be as great. If perhaps he seems like a valorous man with his arms, how great my valour is should not be unknown to you, to such an extent it was exerted in your service. I know well that gifts have not attracted you to him, but I fear that your mind which used to be so very great has become small, and you hesitate to love a person who bears a title greater than yours, fearing to be disdained by me. To be sure this fear should have not entered your mind, for I know you to be a descendant of the highest Roman emperors a fact which even if it were not true could not bring disdain between you and me. Therefore, why have you left me? Woe, how miserable is my life! When will you find another Florio, who will love you as loyally as I did? You will never find him. You have given me ground for constant weeping, because you will never come out of my heart, and you could not. And as long as I will remember myself as having come out of your heart that many times, I will sustain pains without comparison. And what torments me more about this is the fact that you cannot deny to be in love with Felano, because he has shown me that veil with which you used to cover your blonde head, when with piteous words he asked for one of your jewels, and you gave him that. Woe is me, to whom should my sighs turn now to ask for relief, since you who were my only hope have left me was the waiting to see me so annoying that in such a short time you have forgotten me for someone else whom you can see more often. I do not know what to do, I wish to die and cannot. And after weeping for a long time, he began to say again, O oh love, valorous son of Cytheria, help me. You were the starter of my trouble, do not forsake me in such a great danger. You know that I have always followed your wishes. 
reward me for the true faithfulness that I have borne for your lordship, which should have not subjugated me without intention of helping me to the end of my desires. I wish the gods had never let your arrow be aimed at my heart, or let me ever see the light of the beautiful eyes of Biancofi or by whom, through your own power, I now find myself betrayed and deceived. Oh, wretched me, how many times already she swore to me by your power that she would never leave me for anyone else and I made the same promise to her. I have observed it, but she has abandoned me. Where to has the promised faithfulness fled? And where are you, O oh love, whose power has been mocked by this young woman? Why do you not avenge yourself and me at the same time? If you leave unpunished such a notable offence, who will ever have faith in you? You persecuted to death that poor Hippolytus because he disdained your lordship, how come you do not punish this one who has deceived you? I do not seek a grave punishment though, but only that you return her to her original state, and if you do not want to concede this to me, at least assent to close my eyes with your hands, so that my life will not be anguished any more in this manner. Please listen to the prayers of a forlorn one, O oh dear Lord, turn toward him with merciful face in order that he might have some consolation before his death which may it soon take me to displease my father, who is the cause of this ill. In fact, if it were not for him, I would not be away, and, with me, being present, my Biancofiel would have not forgotten me for Feleno although I still believe that out of fear for him, the king, she might have contrived to have another lover. Woe is me to whom every occasion is contrary. To me it happens like unto the ship to which, already half engulfed by the stormy waves, every wind is contrary. Oh, miserable fortune, your wits are being sharpened to harm me and to prepare me for ruin. Alas, why this is so I do not know. You were once a very benevolent mother to me, and now you are a bitter stepmother to me. I remember sitting once at the summit of your wheel and seeing you honour me with a happy visage, this was when the happy face of Biancofior was near me, showing me that love which we equally felt for each other, but I believe that you, envious of such great joy as I felt then did not allow your ever-turning will to stand still, but by turning it not without great pain for me you removed me from your beautiful face and pushed me on to Montorio. Here, living in very great torments, I imagined to be at the lowest point of your wheel, nor did I believe I could descend any further. But soon, with a great mishap, you let me know that there was a lower point and this was when, not satisfied to have separated me from her, you tried to go against the will of the gods by wishing to make her die, for whose salvation, not through your mercy, I became a very daring defender. You kept me in that condition for a long time with more size that I ever had in the past, while I hoped to climb up again if the wheel twined, indeed, I thought I had gone down so much as to have touched the center of the universe. But all this notwithstanding you still wanted that there be no place on your will which should not be sought by me, and now you have drawn me to such a low place that with your power, even if you would turn benevolent toward me as you once were, you could not pull me out of it. I am at the bottom of sorrows and misery thinking that my Biancofiel may have abandoned me for someone else. O oh sorrow, without compare! O oh misery of mine which has never been felt by any other love! Although I am not the first one to be abandoned, I am the only one who was left without a legitimate reason. Forlorn Hypsipyle was abandoned by Jason for a woman no less beautiful and noble than she and for the salvation of his own life, which could have not been accomplished without Media. Media because of her cruelty then was justly deserted by him, who found Cruiser more tender than she. Enone was forsaken by Paris for the most beautiful woman in the world. And who would be the one who will not prefer a queen descended from the blood of immortal gods to an uncouth woman accustomed to the forests? But oh, how many examples similar to these could be found? Yet to my sorrow no like could be found that the son of a king be left for a simple night, where virtue is preeminent in the man who is abandoned. Oh, wretched fortune, if I had attained the love of Biancofi or by deceit, as Acontius had that of Sadeep, indeed then it would seem right that I be forgotten for a likable young man, but not with deceit, not by force, not through adulations, did I receive her gracious love. On the contrary, after trying to find out with her own eyes if I was inclined to take it, and finding that I was she gave it to me benevolently and by her own will, and upon receiving it I immediately gifted her with mine. Why then this annoyance? Why consent that I be forgotten for someone else? Woe is me, for my words do not reach your ears. I wish the gods had never let you appear happy toward me. Indeed, I believe that my sorrow would be lesser because I esteem to be very happy a person who is not accustomed to having any prosperity, for that alone, when it is lost, sorrow ensues. And about what can grieve one who lives always with what he has had? 
You have now placed me so low that I do not think I can go any lower. In that place, as one which is more painful than any other, I will tarry never without tears. May it please the gods that imminent death may soon pull me out of it. And after he had said these things, weeping he would look at the ring that he had on his finger and say, O oh most beautiful ring, end of my happiness and beginning of my misery, may the gods make happier the person that gave it to me than they have made me. Please, why do you not change your clear color now since your lady has changed her heart? Woe is me, for lost is the reverence which I had for you and for the other things received from her. Every hardship of mine has been wasted in a short time, but since she has been taken from me, you will not leave me. You will be eternal witness of my past love, and just as I will always carry her in my heart you will always be on the usual hand. Then drenching it with tears he kissed it an infinite number of times, calling for death to relieve him with her strike from such calamity, and crying more loudly he would say, Alas, why is my life prolonged any more? Damn be the hour in which I was born and in which I first loved by Ancofiel. Now I wish that day were still to come and would never come. Now I wish I had died on that hour so that I would not be left in this world as an example of so much misery. But surely my life will not be much longer. He put his hand to his side, pulled out a knife which he had received from Biancofior, and said, Today will come to pass that which the sorrowful mind imagined when you were given to me, namely that you were to be the means which would end my life. You will be dipped in the wretched blood, held as vile by your lady who, when she knows this, will be happier for having given you to me, because of what will have happened, than for anything else. While Florio sorrowfully weeping was saying these words, stretched upon the bed, Venus, who had heard his lament, having pity on him, descended from heaven into the sad room and induced a very sweet sleep into Florio, during which a wondrous vision appeared to him. Chapter 21 After Florio, overwhelmed by sweet sleep, had forsaken his weeping, a new vision appeared to him. He seemed to see in a very beautiful plain a great lord, crowned with a golden crown, rich with many precious stones which shone on it wonderfully, and dressed in royal vestments. This lord held a very beautiful and strong bow in his left hand and two arrows in his right hand, one was of gold, pointed and very sharp, the other of lead, without any point. This lord, which he judged to be of middle age, neither young nor old, seemed to sit upon two large eagles, with his feet placed upon two lions, and having the aspect of very high authority. And the more Florio looked at him the more wondrous he seemed, flapping two very large golden wings which he had on his shoulders. And after Florio beheld him for what seemed to be a long time, he saw to the right hand of the Lord a very beautiful lady, who, kneeling before the Lord, was praying humble, but he could not understand for what, however, gazing steadily at the lady he thought she was his Biancofior. Looking to the left hand of the Lord, he then saw a very stormy sea in which, sailed, a ship with a broken mast, with the sails all broken and full of holes, with rudders lost, and without any steering. He thought he was on that ship, all naked but for a scarf around his eyes, and not knowing what to do. And after enduring much discomfort upon that ship he saw a spirit, black and terrible to behold, come out of the sea, seize the bow of the ship and pull it down with such force that half of it was soon submerged in the stormy waves. Then Florio, terribly frightened because of the fierce aspect of the spirit and because he saw his death approach through the stormbound ship, with very loud cries ran toward the stern of the ship and shouted at that Lord, help. But that one did not seem to be moved by his words or by his pleas, therefore, Florio was more afraid, sensing that the ship was sinking more every moment. After a long time, this lord told him, I am the one whom you have called so much already in your size, do not believe that I will let you perish. But for all this he did not move. After Florio, crying with very great fear, had waited for a very long time, the scarf which he had before his eye seemed to open somewhat, and he was allowed to see where he was. And as soon as he opened his eyes to look, he realized that the ship had been pulled so far under the waves that little or nothing could be seen of it. Then crying very hard he asked for mercy and help, and raising his eyes to the sky to invoke Jupiter's help, since it appeared that the help of this lord would fail him, he saw a most beautiful maiden, completely naked except for being wrapped in a thin veil, who told him. O oh light of my eyes take comfort. To whom Florio replied, and what comfort can I take when I see myself already under the waves? The maiden answered to him, Cast away from your ship that iniquitous spirit that is trying to sink it with its power. To which Florio replied, And with what will I do it since no weapon was left to me? Then it seemed to Florio that from behind the white veil, she pulled a sword which seemed to be a flame and gave it to him. 
After taking it, Florio gazed at her and said, O oh gracious maiden who in my difficulties try to give me so much help, if you please, let me know who you are, I seem to know you, but the long strain has so dazed me that true cognition is not with me. She seemed to answer thus, I am your Bianco for your over whom today, ignorant of the truth, you have grieved without reason. And after saying this, she gave him a branch of green oliver and disappeared. Florio then with the burning sword went very easily above the waves and wound many times the wicked spirit, and after many blows the spirit let go of the ship and returned, to sea, by the same way in which it had come. After it had departed the sea appeared to have become much more tranquil and the ship, to have returned, to its, original, condition, for which Florio greatly rejoiced, and just as he wanted to fix the broken equipment of his ship, his light sleep was suddenly broken. Florio rose to his feet, sighing and as if dazzled by the vision seen, and found in his hand a green branch of live, for which thing seized by amazement even more, he began to think about the thing seen and about the green branch. And after he thought about it for a long time, he began to say to himself thus, truly love must have heard my prayers and, perhaps to rescue my life, he will return by Ancofior to that love toward me which she had before, in fact, her voice comforted me in the difficult storm in which I saw myself, and from it she gave me reasons to live on, and as a sign of future peace, she gave me this branch of palace leaves. Therefore, if that be so, I would rather wait, crying a lot, for by Ancofior to show me what she wants to do than to kill myself immediately with my own hands, without letting her hear what Felano has told me. Having said this, he took the knife, which lay bare upon the bed, and put it back in its place, and without any delay, as he had proposed, he wrote a letter, which he addressed to Biancofior, the tenor of which was. Chapter 22 If the adverse fates, O gracious maiden, have taken you away from me along with other good things, as I believe, I write to you not with the hope to be able to move you from your new love with my pleas, but thinking that it will be easy for me to lose these words as well as you. If this thing is not as I esteem it, if any portion of salvation has been left to me, I send it to you with the present letter, of which I wish I were the bearer, and for that love that you once had for me I pray you to read it without anguish until the end. And since it seems that it is an outlet of grief for the forlorn ones to remember past happinesses with complaining words, it pleases me, wretched Florio, forsaken by you, to recount them with you as with a person who knows all of them, perhaps, when you hear them, you, who seem to have cast them into oblivion, will realize that you should not leave me for anyone else. Well then, as you know, O oh young maiden, you were born on the same day with me in the royal palace from a pilgrim womb, and you became companion in honours to me the only son of the old king, as you and I were equally enjoying such honours, with his favourite arrow, love wounded one as well as the other in our childhood years. And it was not at such tender age the love of Iphis and Xanti more perfect than ours. And that studying of the books which was required of us, constrained by a harsh teacher, when Richeo was away, we would turn into looking at each other, showing the inestimable delight which each of us had in it. Alas, for then there was still no trace of Felano at our court, who from far away had to come to give you such a joy. But then fortune, bad supporter of others' happinesses, envious of our delights which were satisfied with sweet glances and simple kisses because the age was innocent, wanted to show her power against us innocent, and lowering the never resting wheel with her left hand, she made our secret love manifest to untrustworthy people. When this became known to my father, after grave reproaches from the teacher, I was forced to take leave from you, at which time you and I swore by the high power of Cytheria that you would always by mine and I yours as long as Lachesis, goddess of our fate, would nourish our life. And at my departure you saw me weep, and you wept, and being each of us equally said, we mixed our tears. And just as the embracing ivy clings to the strong elm, thus your arms clasped my neck, and mine yours in a similar way. And it was hard for any one of us to leave the other until you, compelled by too much grief, fell half alive into my arms, only to regain life when I was trying to die with you thinking that you were dead. Now I wish it had pleased the gods that the term of my life were completed then. But then you arose, and having given me that ring which still holds me bound to you in my heart and always will, you begged me never to forget you for any other woman. To these words tears were added so quickly that it was barely possible for us to say adieu. And after my departure I remember hearing that with eyes full of tears you followed me as long as it was possible for you to see me, as I likewise kept always my eyes on the high tower, where I imagined, you had climbed to see me. You remained in our homes, visiting the places where we had been together many times and therein you had some enjoyment fantasizing with such memories. 
As for wretched me, after the sad fates took me away from you, as the gods know, no delight could approach my heart without reminding me of you, and each day my sighs increased as I found myself far from your presence, and those flames, which my father thought to quench by separating me from you, always kept rekindling with more power and became bigger. Alas, how many times I have bitterly cried for wishing too much to see you, and how many times already during the dark hours, when both children of Laetona being hidden keep their light from us, I came to your gates fearing to be heard by my lower servants, and not fearing the death that lies in the hands of insidious men during the night time, nor the fierce lions, nor the ravening wolves using that path at such hours. And how many times young women whose beauties would be well bestowed upon the gods, in order to soothe my torments have tempted me with their love, yet not one of them could ever win my strong heart totally dedicated to serving you. And then, besides all the other tribulations, the gods know how hard it was for me to hear what I heard about you, when you were unjustly condemned to a cruel death, which I, with all my energies provided by the gods that helped me, knowing the injustice done to you, fought in such manner as to pull you, with me, out of such danger. Thereafter growing ever more in major tribulations, fearing for your life, I never became so cowardly as to not endure torments for you, and never for all the things mentioned did I once regret to have loved you, or did I resolve to love you no more, but each hour I did and do love you more, although I have found the complete opposite in you since in my service you have not been able to endure the smallest part of my miseries. You, whimsical youth, you have bent yourself like branches to the wind when autumn has deprived them of moisture. You, through the deceitful glances of Phileno, who has not tempted you for a long time, have turned from my love to his. Alas, what have you done? Even if you want to deny this, you cannot because his mouth has made all those things manifest to me. Besides this, wishing to demonstrate how fervid is your love toward him, he showed me the veil which you took from your head and gave to him. When I saw it, a sudden chill ran through my aching bones, and as if stunned I stood in his presence. Alas, how gladly I would have taken away the dear veil with eager hands and him who was trying to take you from me, I would have flung away from me all ripped apart with the greatest of shame. But in order not to reveal what was in my heart and to hear more things, I endured to look at it with strong countenance for the love of you, remembering that in the past it had covered your head, a very pleasant thing for me to remember. Woe is me, is this now the steadfastness that I have had toward you? Say, do you not know how many and what kinds of women have asked my father for me in the bonds of marriage and how many kinds of women he already has tried to give to me, wishing to take me away from you? Or do you not consider how many pains I have already suffered for you, by being away from you, and I still do constantly? These things should never leave your mind, yet it is clear that they are far away from it, when I see myself being abandoned in favor of Phileno. Alas, what reason could have prompted you to, do, this? I certainly do not know it. Perhaps you refuse me because of low lineage, feeling that you descended from the highest Roman princes, whose deeds have so much splendor as to obscure every other royal progeny, thereby, reputing yourself nobler than I, you have forgotten me son of the king of Spain for another man. But you, most foolish woman have not considered for whom, because if you had looked well into this, you would have found that Phileno is not of royal progeny, not a descendant of Roman prince, but a simple knight. And if what moves you is a greater beauty in him than in me, surely this is a pointless move, since he is not very beautiful and I am not so ugly as to be forsaken by you because of that. If perhaps you see more virtue in him than in me, this I do not know, but indeed, it has been reported secretly to me by some friends that in our kingdom I am considered very much virtuous among other young men. Alas, for I do not know why in writing I linger over those minimal things, for it is a fact that fondness makes the ugly look very beautiful, and the person who is without virtues abundant in all, and the villain very noble. I complain in a more sorrowful manner thinking that even if all the reasons mentioned above were helping Phileno, as instead they justly defend me, why should I ever be left by you? Where do you ever hope to find another Floria who loves you as I do? When do you think you will have brought Phileno so far that he will be inclined to die for you as I did? Woe is me, where is now the faithfulness promised to me? Say, if I were very much removed from you with the same hope with which I am near you, there could be some excuse. You could either say, I did not think I would ever see you again, or you could use the pretext of my being reported as dead. Of these two you cannot use either one, since you constantly hear news from me and you could ever more hear that I was subject to you more than ever. Oh, wretched me, for I do not know what God has used his power to make so that you are not mine as you used to be, and I do not know what sin is detrimental to me in this regard. 
I have not erred toward you, except that I might have sinned in loving you too honestly, a sin with which the painful anguish will comport that you prepare for me, namely, to love someone else and to forsake me for another. But his much I reveal to you until now because, although I cannot stay without you neither day or night unless you are always present in my size, if I hear that this is true, with other certainty than the one with which I write to you, by the eternal gods, I swear that, my life will not be extended for a much longer time, but satisfied that on my grave it can be written, here lies Florio dead for love toward Biancofior, I will kill myself, ever after to persecute your soul, if to my soul, will not be imposed another law different from the one to which it is now bound. I still had many other things to write to you, but for the doleful tears, which hinder me so much, every time the things I have written to you come to my mind, although I could say they never leave it, that I cannot write any further. And what I have written I have not been able to keep entirely from their spots, and the trembling hand, that likewise feels the anguish of the heart which calls me back to the usual sighing, cannot afford to move the willing pen forward any more. Hence at the end of this letter, if I still deserve to be heard by you as I once was, I beseech you to provide for the afore written things full-heartedly. If perhaps there is something written among those things which you do not like, not malice but fervent love has moved me to write it, and therefore forgive me. If what the sad heart thinks is true, I dearly entreat you to possibly turn it back. And if perhaps neither the love which you once had for me nor my pleas can compel you to do it, be compelled by the pity for my old father and wretched mother, to whom you will be the cause for their having lost me. If that is not so, do not let a letter from you delay to inform me of it, because as long as this doubt will be in me for that long your knife will not leave my hand, ready to kill or to forgive according to what I will hear you to be inclined, further I will not write other than, to say that, I was yours alive and yours I will die, may the gods grant you that which will mean honour and greatness for you, and through their pity may they not forget me. Chapter 23 Having written the letter, Florio closed it and sealed it in tears, and having summoned a very trustworthy servant, who was aware of his anguished love, he told him so. O servant dearest to me than all the others, take this letter, which is a most secret safeguard of my pains, and with rapid steps bring it secretly to Biancofior, and entreat her not to delay her answer because I expect it through you. If she gives it to you, let nothing stop you from delivering it to me, earnestly but as quietly as you can, in order that you may remain in my good graces. Go, for I burn with a great desire to hear that which she will answer to this one, and beware that no one else but the very person to whom I send you sees it. The servant took the sealed envelope and, having rapidly reached the royal houses in Marmarina, he presented it secretly to Biancofior. As soon as Biancofior saw it, first of all she asked with sweet words how was her Florio. To her the servant replied. Gracious lady, he is not without one sigh. He is wasting away with undue bitterness, the reason of which is hidden to me. Upon hearing this, Biancofiel began to sigh, asking, Woe is me, and for what reason could that be? For none, I believe, replied the servant, if not for the love of you. He dearly entreats you to answer the present letter without delay, and I, if you please, will wait for the answer. Then Biancofiel put above her head the letter received and before opening it she kissed it perhaps a thousand times, and having left the messenger after telling him that she would presently bring him the answer, she went along to her room, wondering what the present letter had to say. She broke the tender seal, opened it, and barely read the first part when her eyes began to fill with bitter tears, thus, crying ever more as she read further, she finished reading it. But after she had repeatedly read it many times between sighs and sobs, being very anguished in her mind by the false speculations of Florio, which had the semblance of truth because of the ill-given veil, she sat on her bed and thus answered the letter of her Florio. Chapter 24 My eyes were never without many tears, O most noble youth, only hope of my doleful soul, since they first saw your letter, which I read many times over with very grave anguish. Indeed, it was hardly spotted by your tears in comparison to how much my tears drenched it. As I read it, many times I thought I had some lack of comprehension, sometimes saying to myself I do not fully understand it, because it could not be that Florio's intention was to write to me the words which, at first glance, this letter seems to speak. Another time I said, perhaps Florio is trying me, wishing to see if I change because of some harsh words. But after I stopped my every speculation, and I let it be believed by me that you believed what you were writing, I hardly thought I could exert my weak hand so far as to hold the pen in it to answer you, but since even by exerting myself the gods grant me the power to answer you, by this letter that health that I desire for myself I send to you. 
and if the love that I bear for you deserves any trust, I swear by the immortal gods that it was not necessary for you to extend yourself into so much writing to show me how great your love for me has been and is, since I believe that it is much greater than your letter could show or that you could demonstrate with words. And likewise, in it I came to know about the long hardships and the great merits, for which I could never hope to repay even the smallest one. But hearing you complain about the complete faithfulness which I never broke, nor wished to break, moved me to tears and compelled me to write to you, anxious to reassure you that you have never been forgotten by me and it is not possible ever to happen that I forget you. Oh, gracious youth, I do not believe I was born of very fierce and barbaric lions, or of the robust oaks of Ida, or the cold rocks of Persia, in comparing me to the Musipas in insensibility the serpents of Libya, but I was born of a pious father and a benign mother, as I have been told many times, and according to that law by which human bodies are drawn from nature, as I was, but not from fortune. I never learned, nor wish to know how to be cruel and without human understanding, as you imagined me to be. You write that love wounded me as well as you in our childhood years, this I remember no less than you. And certainly, he found me apt and disposed to love as well as you, and I do not believe that he found or has ever found more hardness in my heart than in yours. For which reason, if you have lived away from me in infinite hardship, I never did nor do I now live with pleasure away from you. On the contrary, I feel myself being bothered by several prickings for the same reason that you do, and you never saw from me any feigned tears or heard a false word to inflame you more. But I wish the gods had granted that it had been possible for you to have seen or heard the true ones, which if you had seen perhaps, you would have written with more temperance, when you said that I was not steadfast enough to endure one hardship for you, or in loving you. But since I hope that with the help of the gods all this will be manifest to you through a very clear sign, I will not extend my writing on it, since I am no less afflicted than you by a great pain, hearing that you believe to be forsaked by me for Philano, as your letter demonstrates which when I saw, being overwhelmed by no small pain, I almost died. Woe is me, how much against me is fortune! You are trying to show me reasons for which I was to have left you for Philano, and those reasons you yourself nullify, and truly they are to be nullified. And if you have not lost that sanity which you used to have, you should think that I am not out of my mind as not to know definitely that you surpass in nobility Philano, simple knight of your court, and that I am a very small servant of your father whom you reproach, making fun of me, for being a descendant of the ancient Roman emperors whom may the gods protect so their power will not diminish so much as to drive their progeny into servitude, as I am now. Nor is your virtue unknown to me, nor your beauty full of gracious pleasantness, which for me is reason of intolerable torment, in virtue of which you could be a lover more worthy of the high Cytheria than of me. And certainly, although I know that you are very noble, virtuous, and full of beauty more than any other, and that I am without any of these things, I am not, however, so demoralized as not to have the courage to love you completely, whether I am worthy of this or not. Now then, if all these things are known by me, how is it believable that I could forget you for Philano? And you did not refrain yourself from saying that I, woman of very fragile nature, was not able to endure any adversity for the love of you, as if to say that to alleviate the sighs which together with many pains I feel for you being away from me, I sought to find a nearby lover so that I might rejoice by seeing him more often. Alas, what false opinion do you hold, if you believe this? Surely you do it more to tempt me than for anything else, for I know that you know that since my birth I lived without adversity, like my parents, for which reason I have been forced to become an expert in enduring them. And that if I have endured some great ones, you know it, for you have felt them together with me for the most part. Remember that indeed some sighs were never as burning as those which I emit from my mouth out of too much desire for you, and tears never drenched a bosom in as much quantity as my tears drenched mine, only because you were away. But truly not much time will pass before you will be able to say that I was frail in enduring the adversity by which I am surrounded, for I feel my life escaping me at a rapid pace, and the soul, which cannot sustain the sorrow of the grieving heart, has already wished to abandon it many times, and only some comfort, which I have taken then hoping to see you again, has restrained it. But if you add such pains to those which I have felt until now, as you have done presently with your letter, I will not wait for the soul to take leave, but I will give leave to it, forcing it to depart even if perhaps she might wish to linger on. A new doubt has entered my mind, it is very painful for me to think about it, and I can hardly believe it. But love, that softens the hard hearts, makes me sometime believe and other times disbelieve that you, O oh my Lord, have written to me, saying that, I have forgotten you for Philano, in order that I could not justly complain about you if you have forgotten me, for someone else over there. 
Nevertheless, I do not have such a low opinion of you as to believe it, rather, whenever that thought strikes me, I say no reason will make it so that Biancofiore will not belong to Florio and Florio not to Biancofiore. But my heart is saddened to no end whenever I read that part of your letter where you write that I have given my head veil to Fileno as a sign of perfect love, and you say that when he showed it to you, you would have gladly taken it away from him ripping it all apart. May the gods had granted you to do that, for it would have been no small consolation to my soul, and this is why, I do not deny to have given him the veil, a very unimportant thing, with my own hands, but surely the heart never consented to it, I was forced to do so being compelled by your mother. Because of it he may be taking complete hope to achieve his intent by that sign, oftentimes tried with his eyes and words to draw me to love him, something which I believe to be impossible even for the gods, and he was never able to get anything else from me. But one should not believe that perfect love can be enclosed in a veil or in some other jewel, only the heart can serve that purpose, and I, who feels love for you more than any other, can speak of it with true words. And, to the fact, that I have never loved anyone else but you alone, I call as witnesses the gods to whom nothing can be hidden, therefore, I pray that the veil, unwillingly given, put not in your heart that credence which is not to be assumed. No person in the world is loved by me except Florio. Cast off any melancholy taken up because of that, if my life is dear to you, and hope that you will yet know firmly that which I now promise you, and regard your life dearly as well as mine, at the right time and place the gods will change their mind, maybe granting us a life better than the one that we might choose on our own. Reject unbecoming idleness and seek honest pleasures, and if you will carry me in your heart as much as I do you, you will know that I am no less burdened by preoccupations than you are. I dearly beseech you not to perturb my soul, disposed to seek a new world, with such letters, for although you hold my knife in your hands with a strong mind, a short rope would not allow me to endure the reading of a second letter, if you were to speak to me in that one as you did in this. Biancofiel was always yours and yours will always be. If the fates will exert themselves according to how she loves, without fail you will live happily. Chapter 25 Biancofior folded the written letter, filled with much sorrow, and spread the wax on the tie, and, since her mouth was dry because of too many sighs, she drenched the dear jewel with bitter tears and sealed it. With a perturbed face she left the room and summoned the servant who was already beginning to be upset because of the long wait. To him she said, Bring this to your master, to whom may the gods grant better comfort than he does not try to give to me. And having said this, weeping she kissed the letter and put it in the hands of the faithful servant. This one turned his steps toward Montorio without any delay and in a short time arrived there. He found Florio in his room where he had left him, amidst a great abundance of tears and sighs, and to him he gave the letter he had brought, telling him what he had learned from Biancofior and her words. After he had left, Florio opened the letter received and read it many times over, thinking on the words of Biancofior and making various suppositions over them, and with it he lay on his bed for a long time. Chapter 26 Diana, to whom no sacrifice had been offered as it had been to the other gods when Biancofiel was rescued from that very great danger, had kept hidden the engendered wrath in her bosom until now. But unable to hold it any longer, she descended from the high kingdoms, sought the houses of cold jealousy, and found them completely surrounded by snow, hidden in one of the highest peaks of the Apennines, within a very dark cave. Nearby there was no tree or live plant other than briars, nettles, or similar herbs. Nor could be heard the sound of any happy bird, the cuckoo bird and the owl had their nests upon the doleful house. When the holy goddess reached it, she found it closed by a very strong door and she did not see any open window. The ancient door was touched with gentle touch by the immortal hand, but no sooner it was touched than two very huge dogs, according to what their sounds made manifest, began to bark from within. After that barking, an old woman with a very arrogant voice, placing her eye near a small crack, looked outside and said. Who touches our door? To whom the holy goddess replied, open to me with confidence, I am she without whose help every effort of yours would be lost. The ancient had recognized the divine lady and went toward her slowly, and with no small effort, because of the rusted locks, she opened the door, which in opening made such a great strider that it could have easily been heard even to the lowest slopes of the mountain. And having let the goddess pass through, she reclosed the door with no less noise, barely shielding the white vestment of the goddess from the sharp fangs of the rabid dogs whose every bone could be counted because of their skinniness. She chased them away with her raucous voice and with a big stick with which she supported the old limbs. 
That house was very old and covered with soot, there was no place in it where Arachne had not woven her webs abundantly, and in it could be heard a tumultuous din, as if the nearby mountains clashing together had joined their peaks which, because of the ruinous clash, fell disintegrated down to the plain. Nothing conducive to pleasure could be seen, the walls were caked with disgusting mold, and seemed as if they were weeping from the sweat, and in that house nothing else but winter was felt, without any flame to mitigate the harsh weather, yet there was in one of the corners a little bit of ash, in which glowed two cinders already spent, most of which had been taken over by a slumbering scrawny little cat. The old inhabitant of such a place was very gaunt, smelly, and discolored in her face, her eyes were crossed, red, and constantly blearing. Dressed in many wraps and all of them black, she sat on the floor near the sad fire, wrapped in them and all trembling, and next to her she had a sword which on rare times, other than to scare, she would draw out. Her chest, in which, it is believed, sleep almost never entered, beat so hard that it could be discerned through the many clothes, and the spot set for her rest was the threshold of the door, between the two dogs. When the goddess saw her, she was very much surprised and said thus. O, oh, ancient mother, most eager repeller of the shameful guiles of love and custodian of our fires, it behooves you to plant your anxieties into the heart of a young man, who is very dear to me, who because of too much liberality allows himself to be deceived by the guiles of women, loving more than he must an enemy of mine. But since there must be no delay, move on. He lives very close to here, he is the son of the most high king of Spain, he is called Florio, and loves by Ancofio infinitely, and he never felt that which you usually make lovers feel. Go and deprive him of his pure trust which he now has unworthily, and opening up his eyes let him know how he is deceived, teaching him how deceits must be avoided. The old woman who was sitting on the floor, with her hand on her wrinkled throat, raised her head, looked at the goddess sideways, and with a small whisper a tremble she answered, Leave these sad places, O goddess, for I will give no delay to your order. When the goddess had left, the old woman dressed herself in a new style after discarding her many clothes, added wings to her shoulders, and left her locked houses. Without much tarrying she arrived in the place where she found Florio, who was still upon his bed, reading the letter received from Biancofior. She secretly touched his concerned heart with her trembling hand and returned to the sad abodes from which she had departed by order of Diana. Chapter 27 Florio had reread many times the received letter, and he had almost already accepted in his heart the words of Biancofior, believing firmly that no one was loved by her except him, as she had written to him. But no sooner had the wretched old woman touched his heart than he began to change his thoughts and to say to himself, she definitely deceives me, and that which she writes, she writes not out of love but out of fear. Briseis was flattering the great king of the Greeks while she desired Achilles. Who is he who can protect himself from the false tears and the infinite words of women? If Agamemnon had known them, his life would have been much longer, and Aegis thus would have not had the undue pleasure. Undoubtedly Phileno pleases Biancofior more than I do, and who will be the one who will take a veil from her head and give it to her lover and thereafter make people believe that she does not love him? Surely, she could not make anyone believe that, unless the listener were very simple-minded. In truth one must not wonder that she loved Phileno, he is constantly before her and tries to please her, whereas I am far away and I was not able to see her for already a long time. The fire is rekindled by and lives on through the sweet breezes, and love is nourished by sweet glances. And just as the flames lose their strength when they are not helped by the winds, likewise love becomes very tepid when the glances stop. But this one, if she does not love me, why does she inflame my heart with her compliments? Then he would turn to another line of reasoning and say, Biancofior loves me definitely above all things, and this cannot be concealed from me if I want to look at the truth, but if she does not love me, Phileno must be the cause of it, and of that I will avenge myself without any doubt. Chapter 28 Dwelling on such thoughts, Florio was reviewing all the past actions and facts that had occurred between Biancofior and him, after Phileno had returned to his court from faraway countries, and sometimes he thought that they had been done maliciously by Biancofior, and some other time he would defend them. He spent several days without any rest, full of anxious concerns. Sometimes he would imagine, now Phileno is before my Biancofior and flatters her, but why would he flatter her if he loves her excessively? Then he would imagine otherwise. He was looking with his heart at all those avenues which a man can take in order to achieve his intention, and he believed that none had not been taken by Phileno if it had been necessary for him. He thought that no person ever spoke to Biancofior unless it was on behalf of Phileno, and he feared to have been deceived by his own servants. 
Thus, he lingers in painful anxiety and he does not know what to do, and he thinks that Feleno might order to take her away and that she will consent to it. He thinks that Feleno might ask the king for her and she is given to him as a spouse. He thinks that the messages from Feleno to Biancofior and from Biancofior to Feleno are very frequent. But after her has turned over in his mind several things, he begins to say this, I cannot believe everything that I am imagining for it seems very probable that if this had happened, I would have heard something, and therefore, the justification of the past events made by Biancofior must be accepted. But who knows about those things which are still to happen? From one hour to another the minds are changed, when they are tempted by various ideas. There is no other solution here but to remove every cause through which Biancofior could change her mind about my love, so that no effect will follow. I will go back to Marmarina, in spite of my father, and with my own eyes I will solicit the heart of Biancofior, and then I will run away with her to a place where I can live with her without fear of anyone. If my father may be saddened by our return, I will either have the life of Feleno taken away from him or make him leave our towns. Nothing I would leave you undone so that she will be mine alone, as I alone am hers and always will be. And with these thoughts, having forsaken lovely ones, he spent most of the time seeking with bitter eagerness to get away from some of them and to put some of them into effect. Chapter 29 O oh love, a most sweet passion for those who happily share your benefits, who could think or believe that your sweet root could produce such a bitter fruit as jealousy, a thing frightening and full of anxieties. Certainly no one, if he has not felt it. But being very fierce, as ivy clings to the oaks, likewise jealously has surrounded every power of yours and she is rooted around it so much that it would now be impossible to feel you without feeling her. Oh, most noble lord, she is completely opposed to your actions. You show your flames on high and clear Mount Cytherion, she idles in the dark caves upon the cold hills of the Apennines. You elevate the souls to the highest things, she lowers them and plunges them unto the lowest. You keep the hearts that you captivate in continuous feast and joy, she takes every happiness out of them and with sudden furor she puts in melancholy. She makes one seek the lonely places, and with sharp intellect she never knows that there is anything else than to be pensive. To her it seems that the fast roads of the air are full of ambushes to take away what she wishes to guard well. There is no action which she does not fear it has been done with false intentions, there is no faith in her, no credibility, she always imagines of being tested. And just as you are a most truthful coordinator of peace, she with her armed hand is always setting up enmities and wars. She is very gaunt, discolored in her face, dressed in black vestments, and equally regarding every person with suspicious eyes, you, very pleasant in your appearance, visit your subjects with a cheerful face. She never feels spring, summer, and fall, for her the sun dwells in Capricorn throughout the whole year, and the more she tries to warm herself up the more she seems to tremble. Now, how different is your nature? She delights in being without any light, and you use your holy arrows in lighted places. Although born with you almost from the same beginning she is the ruin of all your good things. And it happens many times that by the very same infirmity which she fears the most, by that she is more often assaulted and oppressed to death. Most miserable beyond the miserable ones can be said to be he who takes her with him as companion. Chapter 30 Florio was preparing to harm Feleno with deliberate mind, and this the holy goddess knew from the high kingdoms. And being moved to pity for Feleno, she began to say thus in her secret heart. What fault has Feleno committed for which he deserves death or outrage from Florio? None, he does not deserve death because he loves that which his eyes like. Let it never happen that because of us the young knight may be harmed. After she said this, she descended from heaven for the second time, and sought the houses of soporific sleep hidden under the dark clouds which are isolated in the farthest places, in the cave of a hollowed mountain, which Phoebus cannot penetrate with his rays in any way. That place does not know when Phoebus, coming upon the horizon, brings a clear day, nor when, having covered half of his course, he looks down at us with a more direct eye, nor likewise when he seeks the setting, here only night is in power and the ground itself produces fogs filled with darkness or with uncertain light. Before the doors of the house wet poppies flower in abundance and countless herbs whose juices contribute to the power of the master of that place. Around the dark houses runs a small stream called Lethe, which springs from a hard rock and with its running makes the little stones move and produces a sweet murmur which invites sleep. In that place are not heard the sweet songs of the sorrowful Philomela, which with their sweetness could maybe put some anxiety into the hearts ready for rest. 
Here there are no beasts, no sheep, no other animal. Here Ellis has no power, every branch rests. A silent quiet reign over the place, in which no door is found that maybe by opening and reclusing could make any noise. No guardian is placed before it, nor is there any dog which by barking could disturb a quiet rest. Here there is no rooster to announce the dawn, by singing, nor is there any duck which could reveal with a high squawk some secret quiet going on. And in the middle of the great house there is a beautiful bed of feathers, covered entirely with black drapery, upon which rests the gracious king with his limbs relaxed, overwhelmed by the sweetness of sleep. A little after him lay empty dreams of so many kinds and as divers as there are grains of sand in the sea or stars decorating Leda's nest. The goddess entered in that house, constantly putting her hands before her face to chase sleep off her holy eyes, and the white vestment of the virgin brought light into the holy house. At her arrival, the king barely raised his heavy eyes, and several times by lowering the heavy head he struck his chest with his chin, and, having turned several times upon his rich bed with regretful murmurs he woke up somewhat. And as soon as he raised himself upon his elbow, he asked what the goddess sought. To him she answered thus. O oh sleep, most pleasant rest for all things, peace of my mind, repeller of anxiety, mitigator of labor and reliever of hardships, most equal dispenser of your goods, if it is dear to you that Cynthia can praise you to the other gods, spouses equally to you and me, order that Phileno, innocent young man, be told in his sleep of the traps set against him so that by knowing about them he might watch out for them. This said, she went back by the same way she had come, barely able to chase sleep away from her. Chapter 31 the ancient god awoke his numberless children of which he had some in men, others in beasts, still others in serpents, on land, in water, in the woods and in rocks, and in all those forms in which they can appear as empty shadows in the human minds, he had those who could transform themselves, after choosing among them those who seemed to be suitable to his needs, he taught them that they had to fulfill the commands of the holy goddess without hesitation. Being ready to do so, without further tarrying, they left to effect his order. Chapter 32 while the fates were thus dealing with the sinister things, prepared, for Phileno, Phileno, himself, unaware of everything, was thinking about Biancofiel's beauty, pining for it with utmost desire, when a sudden sleep overtook him. Feeling his eyes grow heavy, he laid himself upon the bed and fell asleep. To this immediately were present the ministers of the beseeched God, each discharging his office, and in his sleep it seemed, to Phileno, that he was suddenly in a beautiful meadow all alone, gazing at the sky praising its beauties and equating those of Biancofiel to the splendor of the stars that he saw in it. While he was so tarrying, one of those ministers appeared to him in the guise of a dear friend, seemingly crying and running toward him who said to him. O oh Phileno, what are you doing here? Run, for I can tell you that the love you bear for Biancofior has earned your death. You will not be out of this meadow before Florio, armed and with many companions, will be upon you, trying to take your life. Run away from here, O oh dear friend without any delay. Do not wish that I be deprived of such a companion as I hold you to be. And it seemed that before this one had finished talking, already from one side of the meadow could be heard the noise of the resounding arms of armed people who seemed to Phileno that they were coming, as it had been told to him. Then Phileno would arise completely lost, not knowing what way to take to save himself, rather, his legs appeared to have failed him and he could not leave that place. While standing there, in a short time he saw Florio come around him with many other armed men, and with a great uproar shouting, Death to the traitor! They aimed their sharp weapons at him intending to wound him without any pity. To them he said. O oh young men, if any pity is left in you, let it please you that by taking flight Phileno may save his life. You know that I did not deserve death because of love. His words were not heard, and he was ever more attacked with greater harshness and more noise, and he seemed to be pierced in so many parts of his body that he did not think he could survive. But still unsatisfied with that, one of them came forward seemingly to take his head from his bust and present it to Florio. Then, so much pain and fright clutched his heart, that perforce it behooved that the sleep be broken, and almost completely scared he leapt to his feet, looking around to see where he was, and feeling with his hands for the blows which he thought he had received. Upon checking his bed which he imagined to be completely stained with his blood, he found it to be soaked with real tears. But after he realized that he had been deceived by a dream, his fear left him, he remained filled with wonder, not knowing what that could mean, and greatly fearing he set out to seek the dear friend whom he had seen in his dream. When he found him be briefly told him what he had seen while asleep. Marveling about it, his friend spoke to him thus. 
Chapter 33 Dear friend and companion, now I do not doubt that the gods attend with great solicitude to the welfare of the human race. Indeed, you make me wonder endlessly with what you tell me because just recently I returned from Montorio, where I heard, from a dear and trustworthy person, that your death has been desired by Florio and ordered, to be effected, in any way as soon as possible. And when I inquired about the reason for it, he replied that this came to pass because of the veil which he received from Biancofior, the Biancofior he loves more than anything in this world. For that he has fallen into so much jealously of you, that if he saw Biancofior pull your heart out with his own hands, he would strongly believe that she could but love you. Therefore, in order that this love may cease, he is trying to kill you. But on my advice, you shall presently leave this town and by visiting strange lands you will make yourself a guardian of your safety. You may openly know that you are not capable to resist his furor, therefore, do not wish to perish before your time. Let your young age reassure you that you can arrive at a better end than demonstrated by your beginning. Fortune has sudden changes and sometimes it happens that when a man believes to be well in the depth of miseries, then suddenly he finds himself in the greatest happiness. Weeping Felano answered to him thus, Woe is me, and what will Florio do to someone who hates her if to me who loves her has decreed death? Love him, he replied. The laws of love are different from those of nature in many respects, in such an act no one wants willingly a companion. Nor it behooves you to go after someone else's thoughts, but to think of your own good. Even if Florio wanted likewise to kill one who hates Biancofior, are you perhaps out of danger? Certainly not. Therefore, think of your safety. Woe is me, said Felano. Then I will leave Marmarina and the sight of Biancofior? Yes, he replied, it is better for you. I definitely do not know what advantage can be preferred here, said Felano, if we die only once. It is good to live, but it is better to die quickly than to languish by living and seek death, and not be able to have it. It is not, said the friend, for someone who lives hoping in the power of the gods, as I told you before, because future events are not known to us. And to live in any way is better than to die. If one wants to act courageously, he can recover everything lost, but not life. Therefore, each one must be a good guardian of it. Certainly, said Felano, for whoever can take hope, and wait hoping, I do not doubt that it is better to protect his life than wish to die because of a sudden grief. But how can I do this when not only in departing but simply at the thought that I must depart from the sight of Biancofior's beautiful face I feel every spirit fight within my heart and demand death, and the soul, which feels this pain and tempest, wants to leave me? To him he replied, these thoughts are not needed by you, because those who are in a similar situation as you are must make delight out of the necessity. You see that you are being forced to leave, do not imagine to go on eternal exile, but imagine that by order of Biancofior, for whom it would not be grievous for you to die if she happens to order it to you, you are sent somewhere from which you will soon come back. This supposition may help you and will make you more capable of enduring the hardship of your departure until that point when, being accustomed to them, you can endure them without so much anguish. Felano told him, what you are telling me is impossible for me to do because my anxious love does not allow me to hold such thought in my heart, in fact, whenever I am more inclined to do so, then it assails me more with its thoughts, and who can deceive his own conscience? Said that one, the thoughts of love will not assail you once you have cast them out by resisting them. As for the conscience, although it cannot be deceived completely, it can at least be made a convenient supporter of what one wants through a long and continuous perseverance upon one thought. Indeed, I would like this very much, said Felano. Then you can do it, was the reply. Then Felano said, Behold, I am ready to go wandering on your advice. Yes, said he, and I go in your company, if it pleases you. No, Felano said to him. I like it best to grieve alone than to bring you along without consolation. To which he answered, Dear friend, wherever you go your tears will always drench my heart, which will never be without compassion for you but let me go along so that you, having my company, might have less reason to grieve. Felano said, Friend, I like you to stay here so that by seeing you by Ancofior will be at least reminded of me and of the exile which I suffer for her. And if something happens by virtue of which it would be possible for me to return, I want you to quickly send for me wherever the fortuitous fates might have sent me. To which he said, Thus it will be done as it pleases you. Felano then left him, returned to his house, and weeping he began to grieve for himself thus. Chapter 34 
Oh, wretched Feleno, weep because fortune is more adverse to you than to anyone else. Other people leave their towns because of hatred or evil doing, and sometimes they die, but it behooves you to go into exile because of love. Now what kind of life will yours be? It will be painful, but I certainly do not want it happy. I know Bianco Fior to be upset with me as she now shows on her face to have deceived me in the past and to have revealed to me her false love. I will run away from her presence and by fleeing I will please both Florio and her, whose love was not known to me when I fell in love. The veil which I received from her will be the only consolation for me and my misery. And having deliberated this within himself, following the advice of his friend, he secretly went into voluntary exile.